going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. My name is Gavin Stamp, and I'm retracing the route of the old Orient Express, which once carried passengers in luxury across Europe, all the way to Istanbul. The Orient Express was Europe's first transcontinental railway service. It went from Paris through the old Austro-Hungarian Empire to the edge of Asia. Sadly, these days, this great train only follows the old route part of the way. So in Austria, I had to say goodbye to the fancy dining car and my walnut panelled cabin. Vienna was my first proper stop, and I did what one does there, which is to eat cake and drink coffee, visit lots of Baroque churches, pretend to be Harry Lyme in the Prater Big Wheel, and have a few too many in the American bar. But now I am crossing into the former Soviet bloc to visit the countries which were reluctant members of the Warsaw Pact. I first crossed this border well over 30 years ago, and back then it was a serious and alarming business. Oh, well, that was all right. Just a formality now. And now we're in Slovakia, the first former communist country on this journey. I find it extraordinary that the journey from Vienna to Bratislava takes less than an hour. In the old days, it would have taken hours, the train would have stopped, and it then would have been taken apart and all the luggage gone through. My children find it unbelievable that there was a time when Europe was divided in half by the Iron Curtain, as Churchill called it. Machine gun posts, barbed wire, all the way from the Baltic to the Adriatic. That was the state of affairs for most of my lifetime and Eastern Europe was another world. Now, it's all gone, and we're all, I hope, reasonably united. But Central and Eastern Europe can still be a bit confusing. Full of different peoples who seem to dislike each other and who cannot agree on what their countries should be called or where the borders should run. For a taste of this confusion, take my next stop, Bratislava. Bratislava is now the capital of Slovakia, but once it was the capital of Hungary. After the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart, this area found itself part of the newly invented Czechoslovakia. Then it became Slovakia, then Czechoslovakia, and now it's Slovakia again. The past here is complicated. I take an aspirin and head for the old town. <laughs> Dominating the city, perched on a hill overlooking the Danube, is a grim-looking castle. And down below is the old quarter. A pretty square and a maze of narrow cobbled streets. A pleasant relief from the bleak, communist apartment blocks which surround the city centre. And amongst all this is St Martin's, Bratislava's rather sad medieval cathedral. Like most ancient cathedrals, it has been hacked about, with bits taken away and bits added on. Like the steeple, topped with a golden crown, a reminder of the city's illustrious past. You won't find the name Bratislava in any guide or any map printed before 1919. This town for centuries was known as Pressburg. And like so many towns in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was cosmopolitan, multicultural, of course is the word now. There were Germans, there were Hungarians, there were Slovaks, and there were Jews. Perhaps the Hungarians were the most important. They called it Pozsonyi. And in this cathedral, the kings of Hungary were crowned for centuries. Bratislava seems charming and civilized now, but there are dark undercurrents. 
The Slovaks dislike their former masters, the Hungarians, and they resent their former partners, the Czechs, who rather despise them in return. The Hungarians don't much care for the Austrians. With its clash of peoples and cultures, Bratislava may have a painful history, but the visible relics of that history are still well worth preserving. This is incredible. They've built a bloody motorway connecting with a new bridge across the Danube that runs right next to the cathedral. It cuts off the old town from the castle up on the hill. It's a crime of urban planning, worse than Glasgow, worse than Birmingham, with rather less excuse. And I see from consulting old guidebooks, they've managed to make this motorway go right through the site of the old Jewish quarter, the old ghetto. I wonder why. For an historian of architecture like me, the best bits of Bratislava date from the 18th century, when the city was a vital part of the Austrian Empire. And the grandest building in the city is not the cathedral, but this splendid neoclassical palace, which a Catholic archbishop built for himself as a winter retreat. The building is pretty pink and looks ideal for parties and balls. It doesn't look very holy, even if there is a cardinal's hat on the top. It was built at a time when the clergy were very worldly and exercised great power, when the Habsburg Empire resounded to the music of Haydn and Mozart. Perhaps we like to think of archbishops as reasonably holy men, quite without vanity. Yet this one had his own hall of mirrors. And it was in this room that the one event that gets Bratislava in the history books took place. Napoleon was here. In 1805, he defeated the Austrians at the Battle of Austerlitz, and then, in this room, was signed the Treaty of Pressburg, when he imposed on the Emperor of Austria his own terms. The Emperor lost territory, and the Holy Roman Empire was wound up here. These days, the locals in Bratislava seem cheery enough, but if you read through the history section of your guidebook, you might well wonder why. The 20th century here seems one long streak of misery and violence. Czechoslovakia emerged from the wreckage of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, only to be broken up by Hitler. Then, who should liberate the country from Nazi oppression but Joseph Stalin? This stern reminder of that time still looms over the city. Every Eastern European city has its Red Army Memorial. Here's Bratislava's, typically monumental, with at the top a figure of a Russian soldier trampling the swastika underfoot. And all around are the bodies buried of Russian soldiers who liberated Bratislava in 1945, putting pay to a nasty puppet Nazi Republic which existed here for a few years. I'm rather glad this memorial has not been removed. It serves as a powerful reminder that Soviet rule was as grim as it was inhuman. That all ended, of course, with the Velvet Revolution of 1989. But then, a few years later, the Czechs and the Slovaks went their separate ways. And it was the Slovaks who lost out. I won't be popular for saying this, but Slovakia seems to me to be rather sad and pointless. Compared to the Czech Republic, it is a narrow peasant state. And Bratislava, although worth a visit, is no longer the cosmopolitan city it once was. Far more thrilling is my next destination, the jewel in the crown of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, with immense relief, I'm back on a train and back on the route of the old Orient Express. Next stop, Budapest. <laughs> Let's go. 
Another border, another passport check, and I am in Hungary. Thank you. Railway journeys lift the spirit. They force you to stop and do nothing, to empty your head, to gaze out of the window and daydream. The train provides fleeting glimpses of other people's lives, rushing past towns and villages with unpronounceable names. And then the Danube swims into view. This great river has already traveled far from the mountains of the Black Forest and has a long way to go before it reaches Romania and the Black Sea. It will lead me across the plains of Hungary to Budapest. I love railways. It's the only civilized way to travel. So I'm not at all worried if I may seem a train spotting anorak bore. I brought with me my Bradshaw's Continental Railway Guide of 1886, and I'm interested to see that in the good old days of Austro-Hungarian state railways, the journey we're doing now from Bratislava or Pressburg to Budapest took three hours and 40 minutes. Today, it takes three hours and six minutes. There's progress for you. Budapest and a decent railway station at last. I love this one with its great overall iron and glass roof. Great big space. Somehow managed to escape destruction in the Second World War. Buda sits on the west bank. Pest is on the opposite side. The capital of Hungary straddles the Danube and gives you two cities for the price of one. I first came here in the 1970s, in the dark days of communism, when Budapest was beautiful but depressed. Now it's beautiful and gay. This is a proper capital city, unlike Bratislava. It has wide boulevards worthy of Paris, trams and coffee shops like Vienna, and amazing architecture befitting the capital of a great ancient European nation. It is mid-afternoon when I arrive at my hotel, a little tired and bedraggled. I've chosen this place for a special reason. It is grand and eccentric, a kind of Hungarian goulash of Art Nouveau and ponderous classicism. But what I really want to see is inside. This fabulous pool is the highlight of the Gellert Hotel. And after a long day, it's just what I need. Well, I told the director this was the one place on this journey where I was prepared to take my clothes off, but that's because the architecture is so magnificent. So I'm making this sacrifice so you can see what a splendid place the Galette Baths are. This is magnificent. It's everything coming together. The Art Nouveau or the Jugendstil, the use of tile and colour, though ultimately the origin of this sort of thing is Turkish, back to Turkish baths. This city used to be part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And of course the Turks, like the Romans, loved their baths. There was a Turkish bath built over a natural spring here on Gellert Hill. And then the city of Budapest decided to build a new spa here, next to the hotel, but open to all. And it's magnificent. It's a bit like taking a swim in a cathedral. The spa tradition lives on in Hungary today. The locals still come here to be steamed and pummeled, to splash idly around in the warm medicinal water, or just to sit about and gossip. So you're on holiday in, in Budapest, are you? Well, actually, we're here for two purposes. Um, we came primarily for a holiday, but I'm also here on business. Um, and we have heard about the Goya yeah. Baths. 
and we were told that that's one thing in, in uh, Budapest that you just can't miss. Do you agree? Um, I have mixed response. Um, one thing I'm disappointed about is we were told that there were very beautiful mosaics inside the Galeria baths. And I don't know where they are. Well, I they are, but they're in the men's uh, bit, oh. thermal pool. Oh, I see. So not the women's? Well, I don't know. I've not been in. I see. <laughs> <laughs> taking a bath in Hungary is perhaps like taking tea in England. Spas revive and heal. They have a spiritual dimension which we British find difficult to understand. As the sun goes down, I venture into town, refreshed and hungry enough to eat a horse. Which is just as well, thanks to decades of communism, most Eastern European cuisine stinks. Greasy cabbage, black bread, dumplings and boiled bits of pig. But Hungarian food is the exception. The dress code, depressingly, is modern casual. But otherwise, the ambiance is delightfully 19th century old school. There is proper music played by real musicians. <laughs> to start, goulash soup with plenty of paprika and a bottle of robust Hungarian wine. The only thing missing is someone to share it with. Thank you, thank you, I will. I must say, the aspect of travel I like the least is dining alone. I don't mind travelling alone, but when I was younger, I always hated the evenings being alone, um, never quite summoning up either the courage or the cash to go into restaurants. And even now, I'd much rather be with somebody else in the evening. But here I am, all alone. Well, there are several rules for travelling, but one certainly is never, ever to speak to anybody British abroad. They're just an embarrassment. We pretend each other are not there. They're American or Hungarian or German or French, Norwegian, <laughs> Peruvian, but not somebody English, please, or a Brit. We're on this journey to get away from the English and the British, for that matter. Brits, we have to call ourselves these days, don't we? I am not a Brit. I am an Englishman. A citizen of the United Kingdom, citizen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I am not a Brit. I am starting to talk nonsense. Time for bed, I think, before I create a scene. size, Budapest does not feel overcrowded or intimidating. Its elegant buildings have room to breathe. The streets are wide. The pace of life seems gentle. It is all very civilized. The Danube looms large here. It was once a natural barrier between the Muslim East and the Christian West. These days it's crossed by several fine bridges. The most beautiful is the oldest, the Shichinyi Chain Bridge. It's normally rumbling with traffic, but not today. There are few things in modern life as wholesome and well-meaning as a European cultural event. Representatives from lots of nations who can't usually stand each other come together and try to smooth over the cracks by singing painful songs, performing folk dances, and dressing up in silly clothes. This appears to be an international folk festival, or at least a Balkans folk festival. I don't recognize that flag. And the Greeks come behind, but they don't count. <laughs> 
This is Budapest's Danube Festival. Every year, the Romanians, Slovaks, Bulgarians, Austrians, and even the Gypsies and the Jews dust off their clogs and polish their tambourines and get to work. As usual with this kind of thing, there are lots of stalls with people trying to flog stuff no one in their right mind would buy. Uh, do I want to dress as a Hungarian archer? I think not. Just as I'm wondering whether there's a bar on the far side of the bridge, I hear the unmistakable drone of bagpipes, and I am drawn like a moth to a flame. I must confess to a weakness for Hungarian folk music. You either hate bagpipes or you love them, and I love them. It's a common misconception to think they're just Scottish. They're all over Europe, the bagpipes, the bombard. In fact, at one stage, the Austrians made the Hungarian bombard illegal, as it was almost a weapon of war to terrify your enemies. It is fitting that a parade celebrating the Danube should cross this bridge because when it opened in 1849, it was the first permanent bridge to unite Buda and Pest. It was the work of two British engineers, both called Clark. William Tierney Clark, who had designed London's first suspension bridge at Hammersmith, and Adam Clark, the man who actually built it. For most of the 19th century, the Hungarians were devoted Anglophiles. They loved anything and everything British. And just down river, not far from here, is another reminder of home. This enormous Gothic revival building is the Hungarian parliament. If it looks familiar, that's because the inspiration for it was our own palace of Westminster. Westminster was the mother of parliaments so Gothic established itself as the house style for parliamentary democracy. This is the great view of the Hungarian parliament from across the river, and it was just like our own Houses of Parliament, it stands uh, on, on the riverside. But there's one significant difference to Westminster. Our Houses of Parliament is asymmetrical. It's a picturesque composition with the Victoria Tower one end and the clock tower the other. This is precisely symmetrical, either side of the central dome. And the odd thing is, the dome is a feature you don't get in medieval Gothic architecture. Indeed, some Victorian architects lamented that fact and wanted to do a Gothic dome, but never had the chance in Britain. But the Hungarians did it on the side of the Danube, and a magnificent thing it is. The interior is even more lavish and glittering and self-important than our own Houses of Parliament. It's all a bit overdone, but such extravagance was a celebration of independence. This building was begun in 1885, well over a decade after the Hungarians had struck a deal with their Austrian Habsburg rulers to manage their own affairs. So what we have here is a monument to Hungarian national identity and pride. The big central space, as at Westminster, is filled with statues. But instead of hard-working parliamentarians like Gladstone and Lloyd George, here we have proud and fierce-looking kings. And beneath the vast dome sits Hungary's greatest national icon, the equivalent of which we keep in the Tower of London. These weren't here when I was last in Budapest. The crown jewels of Hungary, placed right in the very centre of the building, and on top, the crown given to King Stephen a thousand years ago, partly Roman and partly Byzantine in origin, a very precious and historically important thing. It was used for the coronation of all the kings of Hungary. And I remember Erno Goldfinger, who I knew, the modernist architect who was lived in London, um, was born in Budapest. He witnessed the coronation of the very last king in 1916, Karl or Charles. He described to me how the king had to mount a horse and ride up an artificial mound of earth made from soil from all the counties of Hungary and point his sword north, south, east and west. And Erno said his crown wobbled, which he thought a very bad omen. So it was. Two years later, it was the end of the Kingdom of Hungary and the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. <laughs> With 
Without their Habsburg rulers to boss them around, Hungary flourished and Budapest grew and grew. Lots of new public buildings went up, wide boulevards laid out. This was a modern city, and it was the first in continental Europe to build an underground railway, before Paris, before Vienna, before Berlin. As usual these days, they seem to have replaced all the ticket sellers with an intimidating machine. It will be a minor miracle if I ever get to board a train. Trying to buy a ticket, always a very difficult operation in a foreign country. Let's see if this works. No, it's rejected it, it always does. It never works. No, well, I can't buy a ticket because the machine doesn't like the money. Or does it? No, let's start again. Break. Single ticket. Right. Try it now. I never trust machines we have to put notes in, they never work. Oh! Oh, it's working. Here we go. Oh, the jackpot is like being at a funfair. This underground line was built in 1896 as part of an extravagant national celebration of Hungary's long history. When trains first ran here, it wasn't just to relieve congestion on the boulevards above. It was to take people out of the city centre to one of Budapest's newest attractions. This is Heroes Square, a very important place in terms of the Hungarian sense of national identity. It was here that in 1896 a big exhibition was held to celebrate a thousand years of the Kingdom of Hungary. And it was then that this great monument was begun. In the centre is Arpad and his various Hungarian warriors who conquered the Carpathian Basin a thousand years before. And behind this colonnade, we find figures of various Hungarian heroes and princes. What the Romanians and the Serbs and the Croats and the Slovaks and the other people who were all under Hungarian rule at the time thought about all this pomposity is quite another matter. It's a bit like erecting a monument to Britishness, but making no mention of the Scots and the Welsh. This was a statement, and perhaps not a very nice one. It's a sad fact about human nature that people who are bullied tend to become bullies. After they got their parliament, the Hungarians tried to force all the ethnic groups living in their territories to speak their peculiar language. Sitting peacefully in a park on a sunny day, eating an ice cream and resting my tired feet, it seems hard to understand why the Central Europeans get so worked up about everything. A hundred years ago, it was much worse. Everything and everyone was affected by a new feverish nationalism. In Hungary, it even led some architects to try and develop a distinctly Hungarian style of modern architecture a project which led to some very unusual buildings. This very odd, brightly coloured pile is Budapest's Museum of Applied Arts. It's so very quirky, it quite defies any attempt to categorize it. The architect, Erdan Lechner, mixed ingredients from all over the place. Modern Gothic, Turkish Ottoman, Indian, folk art, a bit of this, a bit of that. And out came what he declared to be a truly Hungarian cake. I love these bright yellow railings in which ceramics are made into these fantastic shapes based on Hungarian folk art. 
After all, this is a museum of applied or decorative arts, and Lechner clearly wanted to show what amazing things he could do with mosaic, with ceramics, with tile. Everything is very decorative, everything is very colourful. After the obsessively detailed exterior, the interior is something of a surprise. A huge white space, light pouring through a glass ceiling, no fussy decoration, and, oddly, the style is oriental. I must say I had quite forgotten just how extraordinary and actually how mad the interior of this building is. We're suddenly transported from Hungary to the Orient. It's all in the Indian Mughal style, with these arches, pointed arches, with their cusps all the way round, and this sort of decoration that you find in Delhi or somewhere like that. All this, combined with a roof of iron and glass, actually makes this seem like a British colonial public building in, say, Madras or Bombay. But why? The answer seems to be that part of the Hungarian sort of national fantasy, myth, round about 1900 was that they were an Aryan, Asian people related to the Indians. They even opened a Hungarian cultural institute in Bombay in the 1920s. It all seems completely bonkers, but the building is wonderful. But you know how it is with fashion. You struggle to look different and then find you're wearing the same as everyone else. This is also true of architecture. Nationalism was part of the spirit of the age. For all its charming eccentricity, this new Hungarian style had much in common with other buildings going up elsewhere in Europe at the same time. I like to see the big cemeteries in the cities I visit. I find them inspiring, not depressing. And the monuments and sculpture can tell you so much about the local history and culture. Besides, in the long run, we're all dead anyway, so why not treat death as part of life and simply enjoy the things it can produce? Gravestones, memorials and funerary chapels. And in this cemetery, there's one in particular I'm dying to see. This tiny little chapel is tucked away inside an existing cemetery structure. It is dark and mysterious, so utterly different from the really depressing, bland, modern crematorium chapels we're used to in Britain. It's all done with cut timber. Is it the inside of a whale, a rib cage? Is it back to the womb, the end of life going back to the beginning? Then there's these extraordinary stalls round the edge with their decorative timber backs, each having a, a top rather like a head. Are they the already departed, waiting to welcome the dead into heaven or wherever? In the 1970s, when Hungary was part of the Soviet bloc and the communists were building endless grey housing blocks and doing their best to stifle any expressions of creativity, the Hungarian architect Imre Makovets rebelled and developed this strange architecture. Just like Lechner 90 years before, Makovets wanted to use architecture to carve out a distinctive Hungarian style. But whereas Lechner's museum is colourful and optimistic, this is rather more sombre. Of course, both reflect the times in which they were built. It all went horribly wrong for Hungary after the First World War. Being on the losing side, they lost over two-thirds of their territory. In the Second World War, they sided with Germany to try and win some back. After the war, the Hungarians, like the Slovaks, then had to contend with a Soviet-imposed tyranny. Perhaps for us these days, it is all too easy to forget how truly oppressive and cruel communist rule was. Budapest now wants to move on, but it doesn't want to forget. This is communist art in exile, banished from the city where it once stood. 
This sculpture was itself, in a sense, an act of cultural violence, forcing on a subject population an idealization of the system that was oppressing them, slavery depicted as liberation. It's easy to laugh at these terrible examples of socialist realism, but they're not really very funny. They are products of Hungary's long, dark night under communist dictatorship, which succeeded the Nazi occupation during the Second World War, and which only ended in 1989. And there's one statue that's missing from this park, the huge statue of Stalin, which once stood in the centre of the city, and which the people of Budapest tore down at the beginning of the heroic Hungarian uprising in 1956, an uprising that was put down so brutally by the Red Army. After the failed 1956 revolt, the monuments which had been destroyed were replaced, which is why so many on display here date from the last decades of communism. A problem for post-communist nations, as the post-colonial ones, is what to do with all the statues, whether they are of viceroys and monarchs or of revolutionary heroes, Marx and Lenin. The civilised countries don't destroy them, but let these objects speak for themselves, and that's what the Hungarians have done. Since 1989, they've brought all these monuments, which were once all over the city, to this statue park just outside to form what is, in fact, a museum of communism and a museum about the collapse of communism. I am glad they have been preserved. For any nation, the best way to deal with a difficult past is not to ignore history, but to face up to it. Back in the centre of the city, the zithers and bagpipes have fallen silent. The Danube festival is drawing to a close. The Hungarians have had a hard time, but you might not think so now. For all their losses and sufferings, the terrors of the Nazis and the communists, the Hungarians are a shining example of optimism and resilience. They don't seem to complain, nor do they resent how badly history has treated them. I like and admire the Hungarians, and I love Budapest. I look forward to coming back. Early the next morning, I am back at the station, bleary-eyed but ready to move on. After a couple of tantrums and a good deal of head shaking, the director has reluctantly agreed for us to take a detour from the route of the old Orient Express. I can't travel through this part of the world without visiting one of the great but little known cities of the Balkans. So I'm heading south. Next stop, Sarajevo. 